Well, welcome. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and we're delighted you could join us uh, in this most important and festive of occasions, namely the investiture of Professor Richard, Richard Ross as the David C. Baum Professor of Law. And I'm, I'm heartened to see so many colleagues and students and friends uh, with us today to celebrate uh, this significant occasion. I want to extend a special uh, welcome to uh, Richard's family joining us today, his wife Jackie, his uh, children Benjamin and uh, Miriam, who I had the pleasure of meeting last night, and Jackie's brother, um, Professor Leo Katz. Um, uh, and of course, Jackie is also on our faculty, Professor Jackie Ross, as, uh, as in all of you know. Investitures are a long established tradition in academia uh, as a way to acknowledge and honor faculty who, over the course of their careers, have demonstrated exemplary achievement in their scholarship teaching and public engagement. Investiture of a named professor, which we have before us today, honors the very highest levels of such academic accomplishment. But in addition to celebrating the honoree and family and friends, investitures also provide a chance to honor the donors, uh, the people whose vision and generosity uh, really make not just events like today, but academic excellence itself possible. The David C. Baum Professor of Law was established by Alvin H., the Al Alvin H. Baum Family Fund to honor Alvin's son, David, who was an esteemed member of this College of Law faculty from uh, 1963 uh, until his uh, um, uh, tragically early death in 1973. Deep concern for the dignity and rights of all persons was central to Professor Baum's character and his life's work. He was an inspiration to students and colleagues, not only because he was an excellent teacher and a productive and influential scholar and someone committed to public service, but uh, I understand also because of his widely acclaimed, remarkable uh, qualities as a human being. Conscientious and judicious, uh, blending passion for justice with dispassionate objectivity, he inspired the highest level of discourse and uh, uh, accomplishment in all who had the privilege of knowing uh, and working with him. After receiving his undergraduate and uh, law degrees at Harvard, Professor Baum served as a law clerk for uh, uh, Justice Walter V. Schaefer of the Illinois Supreme Court from 1959 to 1960. Then he practiced law in Chicago with the firm of Ross, McGowan, Hardys, and O'Keefe until he joined the faculty a few years later in 1963. We are delighted to be joined this afternoon as well by a very distinguished campus leader, Dr. William Bernhardt a Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. Uh, Dr. Bernhard provides leadership in the areas of academic and faculty affairs for the entire University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and he's going to offer a few uh, remarks uh, before we get to the business of introducing uh, the guest of honor. So. Thank you, Dean Amar. On behalf of the Chancellor and the Provost, I'm too delighted, I'm delighted to congratulate Professor Richard Ross on being named David C. Baum Family Professor of Law. These investiture ceremonies are some of my favorite events uh, and one of the happy tasks I get to perform uh, as a member of the Provost Office. Obviously, they are time for celebration, uh, to acknowledge the outstanding achievements of Professor Ross. In his 14 years here on campus, Professor Ross has produced an impressive and consequential body of scholarship on legal history and the story of America's political development. The history of law is central to human history. It is the story of people making themselves into societies and societies making themselves into civilizations. Professor Ross's distinctive voice has helped us understand these fundamental processes and provided key insights that will guide us as we navigate the future. Investiture, investiture ceremonies are also a time for reflection, to reflect on the sacrifices that go into establishing this type of record, the sacrifices that occur as we pursue academic excellence, the sacrifices that are not always visible 
at the end of the day. Think about the hours of meticulous study, the extra afternoons in the library, the willing to, willingness to meet with just one more student before going home, the dedication to read one more article before turning out the light. That dedication is an inspiration and gives us pause to think about our own professional choices. It's also important to recognize that the cost of this dedication often falls on the person closest to the faculty member. So we're very pleased to have the Ross family here, and this investiture is just as much about you and your role in helping achieve this level of, of success. Investiture ceremonies are also a time to show appreciation and say thank you. It is particularly important to acknowledge the support we receive from our donors that allows us to nurture and foster the type of work uh, that we hope our faculty members will achieve. There's no, really no more concrete manifestation of the impact of direct private investment in public universities than through the support of chairs, professorships, and fellowships. These literally are uh, investments in people, in ideas, and in human potential. And we're incredibly grateful to the Baum family and the Baum Family Foundation for their support. <laughs> so congratulations again, Professor Ross. Uh, it's a momentous milestone, and we look forward to your continuing contributions to the discipline of law and to the University of Illinois. Thank you, uh, Bill. You know, the portraits of uh, former faculty members are sprinkled throughout uh, the College of Law, and the picture of, of David Baum is just outside the dean's suite on the second floor uh, heading towards the faculty uh, lounge. And most days I stop and look at him, and I, you know, of course, I never had a chance to, to meet him, but he, 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 the, the portrait exudes kindness, so I encourage all of you, especially on a day like today, to go by and, uh, and look at it. So now, for the business at hand. It's, it's possible that I've known Richard longer than anybody else in this room. I don't know when he met Jackie, but Richard and I lived in the same entryway our first year at Yale Law School. Uh, and we had several classes together as first years. And I wish I had some really embarrassing uh, stories to share with you, uh, and I hope he has none of me. Um, but my memories of Richard are actually, you know, memories of, of him uh, participating and contributing helpfully in class discussions and and uh, and and talking about some of the, the uh, ideas we, we were discussing in class la later on in the in the dorms and the dining hall and I was always impressed by him then and uh, and and am even more impressed by how much he has done uh, since then Richard holds a joint appointment in the College of Law and the history department here at the University of Illinois and is director of the Illinois program in legal history uh, in addition to earning his JD at Yale, he earned his undergraduate bachelor's there uh, in 1984 and his uh, PhD in history uh, in 1998. He served on the faculties of the University of Chicago and the University of Wisconsin and has been a visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, Hebrew University Law School, Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv University Law School. Uh, his research focuses primarily on the development of early American law in a comparative context. He co-edited with Brian Owensby uh, the Justice in a New World Negotiating Legal Intelligibility in British, Iberian, and Indigenous America, and also co-edited, this time with Lauren Benton, Legal Pluralism, Pluralism and Empires. He is currently writing, along with Stephen Wilf, uh, The Beginnings of American Law, A Comparative History. He's the founder and director of the Symposium on Comparative Early Modern Legal History, Every two years, the symposium presents a conference that brings together law professors, historians, and social scientists to discuss a particular topic in comparative legal history. Richard has also studied the political and intellectual history of legal communications, how law is uh, uh, talked about and written about, and has explored the intertwined influence of law and uh, religion uh, on governance. His writing and research, as you would expect of someone who's receiving the kind of honor he's receiving today, are highly regarded by his peers. He received the Carol P. Hurd Award for Excellence in Faculty Scholarship here at the College of Law in 2013 for an article entitled, Distinguishing Eternal from Transient Law, Natural Law, and the Judicial Law of Moses. His colleagues, both here and elsewhere, praise him 
uh, um, for his uh, scholarly work. Uh, one called him, quote, a rare scholar whose uh, writings move effortlessly aclo- across a vast range of ideas and questions. And another commentator, uh, quote, has a way of being so smart, clear, and judicious that it is great fun to read even when I could not care less about the topic he is discussing. (laughs) A third said his erudition enables him to think across disciplinary boundaries that few schools traverse and to develop novel ways of making sense of our legal, legal past. And yet another said he is an incredibly creative scholar who constantly searches for new ways to rethink old questions. Rather than persisting in the same line of inquiry over many years, or continuously using the same methodology, Ross constantly experiments as he adopts and makes his own new questions, new subfields, new perspectives, and new methods. He is unique in his intellectual ambition and unique in his versatility. And perhaps perhaps my favorite professional assessment is this. I know of very few law professors I I consider genuinely learned, and Richard is one of them. His passion and talent uh, are as apparent in the classroom as in his research. His students find him, quote, funny, engaging, and smart, and a, quote, brilliant lecturer who is, quote, incredible at explaining new concepts. One says he is the most intelligent person I have ever met, and on top of that, he is incredibly kind and genuinely hilarious. Uh, I like that a student said the following. Uh, Richard Ross expected a great deal, and this expectation was both inspiring and a little anxiety producing. A little anxiety, just a little, it can be a good thing. And perhaps the highest praise, and I say this, um, uh, and I won't, Richard may not remember who I had for property my, my for, uh, first year at Yale, uh, my favorite uh, highest praise is um, he makes property relatively interesting. <laughs> Apologies to the property faculty. A respected colleague, a thoughtful scholar, an engaged teacher, Richard, it is our privilege today to recognize your many accomplishments and confer on you this uh, this honor you have most clearly earned. So if you stand, I will present you with the medallion, uh, marking your investiture as the David C. Baum Professor of Law, and then we get to hear your remarks. So, thank you. <clears throat> so, Vice Provost Bernard, uh, Dean Amar, colleagues, students, family, friends, one of the greatest pleasures of an investiture talk is the ability to say thank you in public. And my deepest thank you is to my family. I suppose a scholarly career begins when you learn to read and to uh, talk. For that, I'm grateful to my father, uh, my late father, Leonard Ross, and to my mother, Lorraine Ross, who's unable to be here because of ill health. I imagine there's some connection between the books of my uh, toddler days, like Petunia Beware and Fireman Small, connection between that and my scholarly career. These are books that I chewed over, quite literally. Um, (laughs) My children, Benjamin and Miriam, are sitting here in the front row, and for over Well over a decade, they've heard about, engaged with, and teased me about my research interests in American legal history. They're now both in college studying things far removed, um, Eastern Europe and the cognition of dogs. And as the old old proverb almost goes, um, the apple falls close to the tree until a dog takes it to the Russian border. My wife, Jackie, is a colleague on the faculty, and uh, tomorrow will be her investiture please come. Uh, Everything that I've written has been improved by her comments. Uh, You may have heard, by the way, of the famous five stages of grief and mourning. Uh, First, denial. Second, anger. Third, bargaining. Fourth, depression. Fifth, acceptance. Well, Jackie has over and over patiently borne the less famous five stages of academic writing, uh, which are first, proposal. Second, effervescent invention. Third, growing awareness of unnoticed difficulty and the ticking clock. Fourth, self-reproach. And fifth, acceptance, or, <laughs> or revise and resubmit. Um, I couldn't have done my articles without her, but she could have done without the, some of those articles. Um, but even more than my uh, academic inspiration, uh, Jackie is my wife and my love always. <laughs> 
as is inscribed in our wedding ring. Give me a minute. <laughs> From the Song of Songs, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. I want to thank two of my teachers. It's traditional at these uh, events to thank the great teachers you studied under in law school or graduate school. But I think the teachers who shaped you earlier in life had a more profound impact. So my thank you is to, uh, in abstentia, Carol Zuckerman, my sixth grade English teacher at uh, Canaret Day School, and to Arthur Dyke, my 11th grade uh, history teacher at Ardsley High School. And finally, I'm grateful to the family of David Baum. David Baum uh, served with distinction at the College of Law and his family endowed the David Baum Professorship as well as the David Baum Lecture Series, which hosts two high-profile speakers each academic year in civil rights and civil liberties. And now, on to some legal history. Um, I'd like to talk to you about a project that gives you a sense of my comparative legal history scholarship. The project is called Natives as Counterpoint, Thinking with Indians about the Rule of Law in British and Spanish America. Between the 16th and 18th centuries, settlers in both colonial British America and colonial Spanish America used stylized depictions of indigenous peoples to argue about what the rule of law meant in a new world colonial polity. Colonial law invited accusations of arbitrary government, extortion, and systematic lawlessness. But by pointing to specific features of caricatured native life and law, settlers could affirm that their polity adhered to law rather than to arbitrary will and predation, or they could deny it, or they could argue about what all of this meant. So we'd like to ask how settlers use stylized accounts of indigenous peoples as a contrast or counterpoint that helped Spanish and British Americans legitimate, shape, and critique their own rule of law. The meaning of the rule of law in a colonial society presents an immediate problem. The rule of law has been dubbed a, an essentially contested concept because it lacks a single agreed upon definition and because some interpretations of what it requires are in tension with others. The dominant understanding of the rule of law between the 16th and 18th centuries excluded some of the concepts more strongly associated with it in later centuries, such as freedom of speech and conscience, human rights, democracy, and the separation of powers. Contemporaries focus on a core idea that will be at the heart of today's talk, namely the supremacy of law. Well, supremacy of law, but over what? From the Hebrew Bible came injunctions not to, quote, rest judgment, neither to side unfairly with the multitude and the poor, nor to honor the person of the mighty, and also to maintain one manner of law for the stranger and one's own countrymen. This scriptural valorization of objective judgment, uncorrupted by fear or hope of preferment, and neutral among contending social groups, came down to early modern Europeans alongside a different set of themes emphasized in classical antiquity by Plato, Aristotle, and Cicero. They portrayed law as properly the master rather than the servant of government, and as an expression of reason, ideally, reason which silences and contains passion. True laws aligned with justice and serve the good of the community. Ideally, law itself ruled rather than the officials who happened to administer it, a sleight of hand that at once encouraged political responsibility and no end of juggling. The medieval scholastic and political traditions added to these inherited notions the idea that a ruler should subject himself to a Christianized understanding of divine and natural law, and further, that the ruler had a duty to uphold community custom and act through the processes and institutional forms established in the polity. Behind this cluster of ideas was fear. Fear of the potentially arbitrary, predatory, and corrupt ruler who did not act through known standing laws. Supremacy of law, then, ultimately meant supremacy over a ruler's will, which ever threatened to elevate passion and self-interest above the common good, and ever threatened to break free of the restraints of natural and divine law, human institutions, and community custom. Such was, in a nutshell, the early modern understanding. Now, many historians would consider the invocation of the idea of a rule of law in a colonial setting to be tone-deaf, an insulting apologetic, 
in New Spain, which eventually becomes modern Mexico, and in Peru, and no less in British North America, settlers and imperial officials whipped slaves, exploited and dispossessed indigenous people, and enriched themselves with corrupt self-dealing. My objective is not to assess whether the rule of law actually existed in the New World. Such a project first requires adopting or arguing for a true or best definition of that elusive term rule of law, and second, evaluating whether Massachusetts and Virginia, New Spain and Peru um, lived up to its requirements. Instead, my talk is agnostic on whether the rule of law existed and simultaneously fascinated by how historical actors used Indians to argue about the meanings and implications of the rule of law. Even if you believe that the rule of law in a colonial setting was nonsense, there's a famous academic quip applied to another context which said, nonsense is nonsense, but the history of nonsense is scholarship. <laughs> how the British and Spanish uh, thought with Indians about their, how, their own rule of law and how they did that differently then will be the heart of this talk. So let's start with Spanish America. Uh, how did Spanish settlers in New Spain and Peru use Indians to claim that settlers had a tolerable rule of law? The key move involved efforts to reconstruct the law and government of the defeated Aztecs and Incas. There were two main scholarly and polemical traditions. First, an imperial school stressed native incivility, brutality, and vice in support of the Spanish conquest. It vied with another school originating uh, with the Dominican friar and bishop Bartolome de las Casas, a school that emphasized Indian rationality, virtue, and political accomplishment as a foundation for challenging exploitation. Both traditions stressed different elements of the Inca and Aztec past in the service of competing agendas. If read the right way, if read in one of many possible interpretations, each school could support Spanish claims to have established a tolerably robust rule of law in core areas of New Spain and Peru. So let's begin with the imperial tradition. Writers in this school, though impressed by the sophistication and power of the Incas and Aztecs, commonly cast them as tyrannies. These empires, it was said, exploited conquered tributary peoples who were held in check by top-down governance, by, surveil by surveillance and informants, uh, coming attraction trailer to Jackie's talk tomorrow, uh, and by forced population exchanges. Historians have studied in depth how the imperial school accused native societies of disregarding natural and divine law through human sacrifice, cannibalism, idolatry, sodomy, and polygamy. These were sins so severe, it was said, that they justified Spanish replacement of indigenous rulers. But for our purposes, we're not going to look at the alleged violations of natural and divine law, but we're going to look at vi alleged violations of the human temporal rule of law. Why was this? Critics who denounced the native empires for violating the rule of law acknowledged the impressive institutional organization of the empires before damning the underlying purposes to which all that governmental machinery was turned. The imperial school portrayed Aztecs and Inca rulers as abusing their people in ways that defined the stereotypical tyrant in, the, uh, in European thought and politics. Native governance, it was said, pursued as its ultimate purpose not justice of the community, but the subjugation of common Indians and even more the subjugation of tributary peoples. There were highly effective mechanisms for imposing the directives of Aztec and Inca rulers upon the community, but not for restraining their appetite and will. Native kings made laws, the critique continued, in the pursuit of their own self-interest rather than the common good. And Spanish writers profess shock at how the Aztec and Incas made common Indians labor continuously. Now, this was, this was partly for public purposes, fortresses and roads. But forced labor also generated tribute to enrich the rulers and, more insidiously, was meant to break the spirit so as to preclude rebellion. Common Indians were portrayed as the slaves of the Inca rulers. Slaves not in the American sense of they worked each day under compulsion, but slaves in the sense that they lacked, right only, uh, lacked rights over property and family. So 
Uh, only by the Inca's will did common Indians enjoy the fruit of their labor. He could at any time withdraw their right to own property, which was held by his grace. And, the critique continued, contrary to natural law, the Inca denied male heads of households the power to protect and direct their wives and their children. <laughs> Daughters of, sorry, just a little nostalgia there. Um, <laughs> but I'm getting a look here that God intended something else. I'm going to drop that and move on. Um, daughters, upon reaching the age of marriage, could be taken and distributed to the Incas, favorites, and military veterans. And so many of these misdeeds brought to mind familiar abuses, abuses that were characteristic of the tyrant in Aristotle's politics. Spanish imperial writers carefully selected indigenous practices that made the native empires reminiscent of a classical picture of a tyranny. Having done so, the Spanish could then praise themselves as the bringers of the rule of law. Imperial writers congratulated the Castilian crown for freeing Indian commoners in New Spain and Peru from subjection to an Aztec or Inca despot, raising natives up from slavery to the status of vassals or subjects to a justice-giving giving king and subjects alongside settlers. The king's officials, it was said, <clears throat> ruled not by will or appetite, but in the interest of a common good upheld by an extensive imperial bureaucracy. This bureaucracy was thought to provide checks and balances, uh, which were restraints on the ruler's will, uh, checks and balances that were supposedly ill-developed in native empires. Overreaching and self-dealing officials were to be restrained, Indian men's natural rights to control their property and oversee their wives and their children were now to be respected, or such at least was the aspiration. But it was easier to see the rule of law in Spanish governance if it could be presented as the cure for a particular type of tyranny afflicting the native empire. So step one, you define uh, the disease in the body politic, and step two, you offer yourself as the antidote. Against the imperial school stood a group of writers um, indebted explicitly to Las Casas who worked to rebut accusations of indigenous tyranny and vice. These authors emphasized Aztec and Inca cultural achievement, civility, prudent government, and conformity to natural law. Within these admiring uh, accounts of the Aztecs and Incas could be found a tacit defense of the rule of law. The starting point was the continuity between indigenous and Spanish legality. Now, continuity is important because the imperial school narrative relied on disjuncture, on the supplanting of native tyranny by a Castilian rule of law. So disjuncture is key. By contrast, writers indebted to Las Casas um, suggested that the Incas and Aztecs foreshadowed some of the features of Spanish-American governance. Though these writers were typically highly critical of the Spanish Empire, their findings could, if read from a, the right direction, suggest that New Spain and Peru contained arbitrary will in ways similar to the native empires. All right, how do you do this? The Spanish Empire accommodated, indeed expected, significant variations in customs and jurisdictional privileges among localities and among corporate groups and between settlers and natives, subject, however, to the constraint that no usage could violate Christianity or violate an explicit contrary imperial ordinance. Spanish writers indebted to Las Casas found a similar ambition among the Incas. They said that the Incas allowed tributary people to follow their uh, inherited usages so long as these didn't conflict with the Incas' religion or with the general laws of the Inca kingdom. Authors further described the indigenous judicial system in ways that heightened its structural similarity to the Spanish one. Native tribunals were carefully arranged in an appellate hierarchy that reviewed local judges, as in the Castilian Empire. At the apex, judges worked in collective panels that consulted before reaching collective decisions, akin to a Spanish-American provincial tribunal called an audiencia. 
Counselors close to the Aztec and Inca rulers traveled through the provinces inspecting the administration of justice and correcting magistrates in a prefiguring of the uh, uh, similar Spanish system of inspections called visitas and residencias. Parallels between indigenous and settler justice were heightened by using Spanish terms to describe these supposedly similar native institutions. So I mentioned the audiencia, the visita, also terms like the viceroy was used or corregidores, which are local judicial officials. So, and beyond these structural similarities, the Spanish perceived in the Incas and Aztecs foundational principles of the European rule of law that everyone is subject to law, and that there was not to be one law for themselves and another for the rest. The opponents of the imperial school offered then an, a very, in el certain elements, a very sympathetic account of Aztec and Inca civilization that allowed readers to find, if they looked, a defense of Spanish-American claims to the rule of law. To challenge the demeaning caricature of Indian empires as tyrannies. These authors instead found native imperial management of diverse local customs, a well-articulated system of hierarchical appellate review, periodic visitations and corrections of officials, and a commitment to equal and universal application of law. Aztec and Inca governance then appear to foreshadow in key respects the Spanish empire. And the more that native, emp native empires foreshadowed Spanish governance, the more that New Spain and Peru appear to maintain continuities with pre-contact indigenous legality, and the more that they seem to draw on similar practices and ideas to elevate law above will and self-interest and passion. This appreciative reconstruction of the Aztec and Incas, like the damning one of the imperial school, lay open to multiple interpretations. In each case, a reading could be turned to support the Spanish-American law, if by different routes. So this is one way, then, of thinking with Indians about your rule of law. Let's now turn to another set of ways um, in uh, British uh, North America. The Spanish-American moves were not available to the English settlers. They built their colonies not on the wreckage of grand indigenous empires, but next to a diverse array of modestly sized native polities. The English did not live among uh, millions of Indians while reshaping their indigenous legal orders in ways that allowed the settlers to flatter themselves as um, uh, uh, liberators replacing tyranny with law. Settlers seldom tried to reconstruct centuries of native history and even less glimpsed in it prefigurations of their own rule of law. The English then did not think about the rule of law by trying to orient themselves to a native past as the Spanish did. Rather, Indians, who were very much alive in these polities next door, Indians served as a living counterpoint that helped the English analyze and dispute about their rule of law. And here's three ways in which it happened. First, let's begin with the challenge of containing violent self-help. From the beginning of colonization, Europeans were fascinated with the distinction between their own and Indian treatment of murder. Indians expected a killer and his relatives to do what's called covering the grave, that is to present uh, compensation to the victim's kin in order to forestall vengeance by the victim's kin. No Indian state um, in North America maintained a monopoly of legitimate violence. The English, by contrast, insisted on public trial and punishment of the murderer himself. Punishment could not be bought out by offering compensation, nor could penalties be redirected against the kin of the murderer who were offered as a substitute as an Indian custom allowed. And historians have at length reconstructed negotiations between the British and various native nations on whose system of justice would prevail in what territories and for what people. But alongside this story is a second story one connected to colonial government struggles to assert the rule of law over their own settlers. There were areas where the colonies had tenuous control, 
say, over dispersed plantations and trading posts and in the back country. And in these areas, settlers claim the right to privately judge supposed offenders and inflict violence upon them. Now, public authorities, not surprisingly, argued that this private vengeance offended the rule of law. It was erratic and arbitrary, driven by passion and self-interest, lacking neutrality and due process protections. Since settlers, no less than natives, were in the business of undertaking private vengeance, governments tried to restrain both sides. This interplay of settler and native violence outside the regulation of a state provided a challenge to colonial authorities. But it's a challenge that invited them to assert governmental control in the service of the rule of law. So let's consider the colony of Virginia as a case study. Virginia, at first, permitted violent self-help against natives before later legislating against it. So a 1632 statute was directed at, quote, the neighboring Indians are irreconcilable enemies. And this statute <clears throat> allowed a plantation head who lost cattle or other animals or property to natives to, quote, raise a sufficient party and fall out upon them and persecute them as he shall find occasion. A 19, uh, 1649 act allowed settlers within limits to kill Indians in specified areas. Indians could be killed if, quote, taken in the act of doing trespass or other harms. Um, in which the oath of that party by whom the Indian is discovered shall be full and sufficient evidence. So this restriction left intact the right of private people to judge and execute Indians outside the, uh, le the legal system of the colonies and compelled the government to accept the oath of the person executing the Indian. Not that the government would evaluate the oath, but the government was compelled to accept the oath. Seven years later, in 1656, <clears throat> Virginia repealed the 1649 Act, in part because it acknowledged that its former legislation violated two concerns of the rule of law, proportionality in punishment and neutrality in judgment. The colony realized that trespass or petty theft was too small an offense to warrant death, and more importantly, quote, and the evidence was too weak coming from only one witness who should not be allowed, that is, be allowed to testify, being a party. In other words, shouldn't be allowed to, to testify, have his oath accepted, and be able to kill the Indian on his own say-so. Virginia's growing interest in restricting settlers' resort to violent self-help can also be found in treaties. Lieutenant Governor Alexander Spotswood concluded agreements in 1713 with the Tuscarora and the Nottoway nations that provided that, and this is a fairly common phrase, that proper judges shall settle disputes between Indians and settlers. This is typical. But then went on to say, for that purpose, neither shall either party be permitted to seek redress by any other means. This phrase, either party, any other means, signals that by treaty, settler, no less than native violent self-help, was going to be prohibited. <clears throat> Virginia, as we see, was not only trying to prohibit violent self-help on both sides, but the process was occurring in parallel, and each side was reinforcing the other. Criticism of Indians' vengeance against private settlers' pretensions to judge in their own case and unleash violence on their own authority was a backdrop against which the uh, colonies were trying to solidify their own rule of law and impose its norms on their own settlers. So this is a very old set of issues that runs back through the Bible and classical antiquity, this question of the public control of violence uh, self-help and, and vengeance and the degree to which compensation can substitute for uh, uh, um, uh, uh, state-run execution. But this it, very old issue became in a colonial context bound up with Indians. Okay, let's turn to our second example of colonists thinking with Indians, and that involves their portrayal as a counterpoint to despotism. The rule of law, an elusive term, was commonly defined against its opposite, arbitrary power and tyranny. 
Anglo-Americans held up Indians as examples of what was not despotic, allowing them to shape their own rule of law. The English came to be impressed with the absence of Indians in Indian societies of what was understood as despotism within European political thought. Certain persistent continuities mark the figure of the tyrant since the Renaissance, when Europeans intensified engagement with, the cla with classical political thought. To begin with, the tyrant refused to heed and solicit counsel. Counsel turned rulers from passion to reason, from self-serving willfulness to the common good. On this point, Indian nations stood out as the negation of tyranny, for they placed council, private and public, at the center of their polities. Europeans came to realize that Indian rulers stood as first among equals within a complex system of kinship alliances and uh, political alliances, where public opinion defined the possibilities and limits of political action. Europeans were particularly struck by the extraordinary regularity and decorum at public councils, where Indian uh, uh, rulers and subjects debated policy. The stereotypical um, tyrant was no less selfish than he was heedless of advice. So John Locke, in reflecting the English mainstream, defined tyranny as power exercised by a ruler not for the good of those who are under it, but for his own private, separate advantage. And what you see in the sources is colonists continually praising Indian leaders for avoiding greedy, self-serving rule, the tyrant's vice. New York counselor Cadwallader Colden said that if a native sachem should once be suspected of selfishness, he would consequently lose his authority. Europeans saw in natives also uh, traits reminiscent of so-called Roman political virtue. Natives, it was said, proudly bore arms and admired martial feats. They were independent, able to obtain their livelihoods from hunting, fishing, and modest agriculture. No great men supplied their food or their weapons. This line of interpretation concluded with an admiring account of Indian political character, seeing in them sincere patriotism, love for their constitution, and self-sacrifice. These virtues persisted not because of fear of coercion, but from intensive education and socialization. So how did this sketch of Indians as noble Romans enter into debates about the rule of law? The image of the Indian as noble Roman continued the work then of positioning natives as the antithesis of stereotypical European despotism. The tyrant, in addition to being selfish and not heeding counsel, exercised cruel dominion upheld by fear over unwilling subjects. He undermined his people's independence. He undermined their economic independence by intrusively re regulating their land and labor, or more far-reaching, by formally denying that they had rights and property, saying they held everything by his grace. He struck at his subject's psychological independence by demanding the performance of servile obligations continuously, which corroded self-confidence and filled the day with busy work so that political action was precluded. Mistrust, dishonesty, self-seeking, fear, top-down commands, these were all the hallmarks of tyranny. Against this stood the depiction of the Roman Indians, economically and psychologically independent, martial, patriotic, self-sacrificing, and living in polities oriented around consent, counsel, and the regulation of behavior through social cues rather than repression. So controversialists constructed the ever-contested definition of the rule of law in opposition to the images of arbitrary power salient within their frame of reference. The Bible and histories of classical antiquity and contemporary Europe provided no shortage of tyranny of tyrants and of people who resisted or rebuked them. King Ahab had his prophet Elijah, as Caesar had his Cicero and Cato the Younger. Natives likewise loomed within the colonist frame of reference. They weren't far away or distant in time. They lived next door. And they were treated as living negations of despotism, which helped shape, for settlers, the meaning of the rule of law. Our third example of thinking with Indians about the rule of law 
involves debates within colonial society about what was called Anglicization of law. From the later 17th century through the revolution, colonial society was powerfully reshaped by increasing imperial oversight and by commercialization. Historians have detected under the force of these pressures a reorientation of the colonial legal systems from the last quarter of the 17th century forward. This process has been dubbed Anglicization. Now, let's go back before that to the 17th century. The legal systems in the 17th century were overwhelmingly staffed not by trained lawyers or imperial appointees, but by uh, laymen who administered non-technical discretionary justice and brushed aside inconvenient ordinances. Magistrates were selected more for their social prominence than for their knowledge of law, and they praised fairness and common sense and looked down on legal niceties. By the turn of the 18th century, important elements of this system were under stress. Population growth and dispersion and the expansion of long-distance trade and credit meant that disputes more frequently arose among strangers at arm's length. Commercialization created pressures for a more predictable, lawyerly, and formal legal system, one attentive to English technicality. Settlers who were dealing across colonial boundaries or with imperial officials uh, were pushed towards using English precedents and procedures as a lingua franca. And as tribunals increasingly respected, rather than recoiled from technicality, there was pressure to hire lawyers who understood this lingua franca. All of this undermined the simplicity and accessibility of colonial justice. Colonists, there were many of them, who resented this shift. And they liked to compare an earlier era of approachable, easily understood lay justice to a law now growing increasingly formal and alienating. Uh, Virginia planter Robert Beverly looked fondly on the courts of his youth, which determined lawsuits by the standards of equity and good conscience. Now, he said, the trickery and foppery of the law was epidemic, and the niceties of pleadings with all the jingle jangle of England was creeping into Virginia, he said, with great unhappiness. Settlers spoke against anglicizing justice, not only in their own voice, but through Indians. They published critiques of European law attributed to natives that mixed indigenous opinions and the author's own agenda. So consider an account by James Adair, who lived and traded in the mid-18th century among the southeastern tribes. Uh, Indians, according to Adair, and this is what I'm about to read you, sounds iffy if it was Indian speaking and sounds much more like Adair. These Indians, according to Adair, recommended that settlers' voluminous laws scattered through old books be reduced into an honest small book, one that poor people could buy and read. Pruned, accessible, published law would help lay people avoid snares and free them from the fees and manipulations of attorneys. Obscure law reliably produced tedious, delay-ridden court proceedings vulnerable to manipulation. The quotation of quibbles from old books confused the law and confused just with unjust causes, and the poor in particular suffered from the perplexed science of granting equity, perplexed because you, it was hard to understand and you had to pay for it. Now, this so-called Indian critique appears more um, clearly, the purposes and limits appear more clearly if you compare it to critiques doled out or attributed to, to Indians in the Spanish and the French empires. The French were notable for their habit of critiquing European law through the vehicle of the so-called noble savage. So a famous example is Baron uh, de La Hontan's dialogue between a Huron and a French soldier. Uh, these so-called Hurons um, were said, or were said they were, and in part were portrayed by the French as, quote, strangers to the measures of meum and tuum. That's strangers to what is mine and to what is yours, strangers to distinctions of property. And it was also said that the Hurons rejected European-style law, which they held to be a deviation 
from reason and justice. They saw European-style law as a form of artifice that allowed the French to do wrong by obscuring natural, readily apprehended, rightful, and innocent conduct. Spanish America provides a different vantage point for looking at the British case. In Spanish America, the indigenous people were very much within the system, not outside of it. Uh, in British America, Indians were foreigners and less naturalized, and most dealings with the British were by treaty. But by contrast, Indians within uh, New Spain, Peru, and other uh, core areas of the Castilian Empire were vassals of the crown. They constantly confronted a bureaucracy that calibrated the labor and tribute to be extracted from them, that reordered their governments and their leadership, and decided when to Hispanicize their customs. Uh, so uh, uh, con Indians considered this legal bureaucratic empire from the standpoint of subjects who lived under it rather than next to it. And their, uh, the Indian critiques and evaluations of it respect, uh, uh, came from this perspective. So consider uh, the writings of Philippe Guaman Palma, for instance, an Andean uh, uh, Indian descended from a noble Inca family. He harshly criticized local judicial and executive officials and stewards and mine owners for exploiting indigenous people. But his solution was to make the extensive Spanish-American state more open to Indian complaints and turn that state against the Indians' tormentors. He said that judges should accept petitions in Indian languages. He said that state officials should periodically inspect the mine owners and the stewards who were the local people on the ground tormenting Indians. Now notice, Guam and Poma was in no position to, as in the nature of La Hontan's Hurons, reject law as an uh, artifice corrupting natural rectitude, because the sole hope for his fellow Indians was to mobilize the extensive Spanish-American bureaucracy to step in and reduce the extortion. So if you take Adair's Indian so-called Indian perspective, and compare it to the French and Spanish, you see that Adair is giving you a particular kind of protest ideal. Notice that Adair's natives do not, in the style of the Andean Indians, call for improvements on their own behalf in an imperial dominated bureaucratic justice that surrounded and enveloped them. Nor do Adair's Indians simply reject European law and property in a thoroughgoing fashion in the way of the so-called noble savage Hurons. Rather, Adair's Indians suspiciously adopt a reform scheme that was voiced by Anglo-Americans from the 16th through the 18th century. They scorn the multiplicity of hard-to-find laws and the snares of non-intuitive procedures, and they said, we ought to print the law in a slim volume that everyone can buy. So English colonists listening to, to, through Adair to a mixture of the natives' own perspective and to Adair's ventriloquism could hold fast to the European rule of law while disparaging its unwelcome drift towards an estranging Anglicization. So this is another way that the English are thinking with Indians about their rule of law. So what in the end does it mean, to conclude, to think with Indians about the rule of law? When settlers use natives to reflect upon the challenges and uh, uncertainties of law, those challenges and uncertainties might not involve any actual Indians. Now, sometimes they did. Sometimes a conflict with indigenous people, say over um, uh, covering the grave, acted as a catalyst to generate arguments that would spill over into other areas of colonial preoccupation, like containing settler violence. But sometimes, settlers use natives to participate in rule of law debates in ways that scarcely implicated any actual living natives and that had no analog in Indian society. The dead Aztec and Inca rulers had not mused about the implications of their own legal order for the Castilian rule of law. The Seneca and the Cherokee were not debating among themselves the stereotypical image of the European tyrant. Adair southeastern tribes tacitly commented on Anglicization, maybe, but it was British imperial government and commercialization, not the natives, that were driving Anglicization forward, benefiting from it or suffering from it. 
So thinking with Indians in the end is not a single mode of thought. It's an array. Natives appeared in many guises as a baseline or a counterpoint against which to define aspirations and to measure colonial achievements and shortcomings as ethnographic raw material, as a front for ventriloquism, and as an exemplar of practices, whether positive or negative, admirable or repellent. In all of these various ways, the British and the Spanish colonists were using natives to think about their own rule of law in a colonial context. Thank you. <laughs>